know, one of the key things that Pastor Daniel shared with us last weekend is this statement. The fact that we get a chance to repent of our sins is an act of amazing grace. The fact that we get a chance to repent of our sins is an act of amazing grace. Because what do we deserve? We deserve death because the wages of sin is death. And, but yet God gave us a chance to repent and turn back to Him. And that is the beauty of grace. And that's what makes it so amazing. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord isn't really being slow about His promise as some people think. No, He's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. This is God's amazing grace in our lives. God is patient with you. He desires for all our pre-believing friends, our family, to come to know Him. Even you as well. If you're far away from Him, God desires for you to come back to Him. He is patient with you. You see, while we thank God for His amazing grace in our lives, that our sins can be forgiven, that we can turn back to Him and ask Him for forgiveness whenever we sin. But that does not mean that we can take God for, for granted. We can take His grace for granted. You see, God's amazing grace doesn't mean that we should continue to live a life of sin. You see, if we are really honest with ourselves, it's... Being a Christian, walking with God is something really tough. It is a difficult journey because the devil is always out there to tempt us and then he always wants us to get out of God's purposes and he always wants us to fall into sin. And that is why this brings me to this, my message this weekend, which is called the straight and narrow. Say with me, the straight and narrow. You see, the title comes directly from Matthew chapter 7. It says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only few find it. And let me share with you something interesting about this phrase called straight and narrow. You see, while it is commonly accepted that it's straight, not crooked, but the original word used is actually straight as in the straits time. If you look at Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 to 14, in the King James Version, okay? It says, verse 13, it says, Enter ye in the straight gate. Verse 14, it says, Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way. You see, straight refers to a narrow passage of water that isn't necessarily very easy to maneuver through. If you look at the picture, it's actually a, a passage, it's, it's difficult to pass through, but yet it connects two uh, bodies of water. And straight is also used in the word straight jacket. You know the jacket that, that um, it binds somebody up, especially if it's a patient and the patient is probably not sound and he wants to break free, but that, that straight jacket. It also has the meaning of being constricting. And, and that's, why, that's why essentially straight and narrow means a constricting and narrow path. So that's why when the Bible says that the straight is the gate, it means the passage is difficult to pass through. That gate is difficult to pass through. And however, this phrase ended up being known as straight and narrow. The straight meaning that it's not crooked. Well, which kinds of work as well because, because if you look at Proverbs chapter 3, verse 6, it tells us, In all your ways submit to Him and He will make your paths straight. It's like telling us that God will make our path straight. It is a, a straight path. It's an upright path that God wants us to, to walk on. Well, it's nothing major here, but I thought that it's something that I just want to share with you. And as we come back to today's sermon, when we talk about the straight and narrow, we're talking about us staying true and staying on track on God's path. And that means living a holy, upright and righteous life. I believe we all want to live such holy lives, right? How many of you, you do not want to live a holy life? Put up your hands. I believe we all want to live the life that, that pleases the Lord. But yeah, just like what Matthew chapter 7 says, it is difficult, it is tough, it is, it is not easy. And to be honest, I believe that all of us, we try. We try to be pure, we want to be pure, we want to be holy. We want to walk according to God's purposes. We want to walk according to God's ways. 
And we do everything that we can to please the Lord. But I believe along the way, this is a difficult journey. We all stumble and fall. We end up in sin. We end up doing things that we know in our hearts that we shouldn't be doing. And if that's you, I want you to know you're in good company. You know why? Because the Apostle Paul, he himself, he had a struggle. In Romans chapter 7, verse 19, it says, For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. You see, the devil is a schemer, he's a liar, he's a father of all lies. You see, the more we know that this is God's will for us to walk that straight and narrow path, to, to walk, to live a life that is pure, that is holy, the devil is always out there trying to tempt us away from it. He wants us to fall into sin. And that's what he did with Adam and Eve. That's what he did with Samson. That's what he did with Peter and, and the list goes on and on. And that is why I want to bring all of us to today's main scripture. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19 to 26. Let's read it aloud, alright? Can we read it together? Is that okay? If you want to read it aloud, let's, can you say an amen? Amen, thank you. One, two, three. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm. Sealed with this inscription, the Lord knows those who are His. And everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. In a large house, there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for special purposes and some for common use. Those who cleanse themselves from the leather will be instruments for special purposes, made holy, useful to the master and prepared to do any good work. Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love and peace along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. Can we just look to the Lord in prayer right now? Holy Spirit, we want to welcome you. We want to ask that you will reveal the Word of God to each one of us and you illuminate the truth of God into our hearts. And I declare that your truth will set us free today and that Holy Spirit, that you will help us and guide us to walk in holiness and in purity. And I declare that today there will be a breakthrough. And I declare that today that you will open up our hearts, Lord, to receive, Lord, whatever that you want to speak to us. So, Lord, I want to commit this time into your hands. And I ask that, Lord, that I will, in, I will decrease and, Lord, that you will increase. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people say, Amen. You see, if you truly desire to walk on the straight and narrow, if you truly desire to stay on track in God's path, to live a life that's holy, upright, and righteous, there's one thing that I want to tell you right now. You need to flee from temptation. Why don't you turn to the person on your right and say, you need to flee from temptation. You see, in the context of 2 Timothy, it's actually the Apostle, Apostle Paul's final word to his spiritual son, Timothy. And he is writing it to him because he wants to tell him that, that how to walk with God and, and, and sort of discover his own way through the ministry. And these are actually final words that Paul was talking to Timothy about temptation. That's why in verse 22 he says, Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. You see, evil desires of youth or youthful lust can, 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 can mean many things. Well, it can be a lust for money, a desire for honour and recognition. But one thing I want you to know, that it does not matter how young or how old you are. It does not matter whether you are a 10-day-old Christian or a 10-year-old Christian or a 40-year-old Christian. I want you to know that all these evil desires creep into our lives. And that's why as your pastor, I want to tell you this. Don't give in to the desires of your youth. Flee from these temptations. And that is why today the question that I want to explore with all of you today is this. How can we flee from temptation? 
And I want to share with us two ways that we can do and, and what happens when we do these two things. Number one, the first way that we can flee from temptation is by seeking the Lord. And by that, I mean that we lay hold of God and continually enter into His presence. And this is something that we must take seriously. Seeking the Lord with a sincere and con intense conviction and continually dwelling in His presence is one of the best ways to flee from temptation. Let's come back to verse 30, 22 again. Paul makes it very clear to Timothy. Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love and peace along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. You see, essentially, we are either pursuing God or pursuing our evil desires. You see, when I, when I, when I read this passage, I, I see a spectrum. On one end is God and on the other end is our evil desires. You see, at any point in time, at any day of our lives, or, uh, or any, more, any second, we are either gravi gravitating towards one of it. Either we are moving towards God's righteousness or we are moving towards our evil desires. And, and the reason why many of us, we succumb to temptation and we fall into sin is really because we don't make entering into God's presence or seeking God a priority. You see, often when we deal with people, you know, you know when, I, when, when people come and confess their sins to me, when I talk to people who, who struggles with sin, there is always one question I will ask them. How's your quiet time with God? How's your quiet time with God? Is it really very quiet? Because, well, I think we can call it quiet time, but I think there are other, I know I have a friend who, who calls it talk time because you're supposed to be talking to God and hearing God talk. Well, I think you can, whatever you want to call it, you can call it prayer time, devotional time, Bible time, or whatever it is. But the point is, are you spending time with God? And how are you spending that time with God? You know, the truth is this. I believe in any congregation or any church, even here in this place. The first time that we ever pray, probably is in a cell group. The first time that we ever pray is, is coming to a service like this. The first time that we ever pray is during the weekday is when we say grace before a meal. The only time that we ever talk about God or read His Word is probably during cell time. And the only time that we worship it's probably here in, in, in service or maybe they're, they're, they're one or two times a week. And if this is how we are living our lives, I want you to know that we are very susceptible to temptation and sin. And we need to understand what it means to seek God, to enter into His presence. You know, seeking God, it really means to, to desire a relationship with Him. When you say you seek God, it means to come to Him for help because you recognize that you are lacking, you are needy, you are weak. And when we seek God, we are seeking God to help us with something or to give us something. You see, we seek God for wisdom where we need a solution for a situation in our lives. We seek God for guidance when there's, there's a certain decision that we need to make. We seek God for strength when we feel we are weak and we are weary in our physical body, or we are just feel like giving up, we seek God for joy. When we feel that there's a lot of sadness within our families, we seek God for deliverance, so on and so forth. We basically, we seek God in everything that we do and in all situations. And this is what I meant when I asked, how is your quiet time with God? It is more than just checking you on whether you are reading your Bible or whether you are praying. I think it is more than that. It is really asking you whether are you seeking God for every area of your life. You see, there are, in every area of your life, we must learn to seek God. Take for example. You see, if we don't seek God, most of the time we will fall into temptation and, and eventually we succumb to sin. You see, when I was a new believer, when I was in my 20s, when I was in university, I just came to know the Lord. And one of the things that I struggle with is with pornography and masturbation. And, and I struggle very, I mean, it's something that I'm addicted to. 
And usually, why is it that I always fall into it? I know after I came to know the Lord, I went for encounter, but I still fall into it. Really because the desktop is in my room. Okay, last time it's desktop. Okay, you don't usually buy a laptop, but it's desktop. And the internet is not so fast like now, which is quite scary. And because the desktop is in my room, and when, when I'm alone in a room, well, I think I'll just succumb to my evil desires. And I'll just look at things that I shouldn't be watching and doing things that I shouldn't be doing. And after that, I need to seek God. And then God told me that I need to confess to my leader. So I told my leader. And of course, well, I think your, I believe your, my, my leader gave me a very wise counsel, especially to all guys. Place your desktop in the living room. Okay, so I did that. I put it, I placed it in the living room. My parents were thinking crazy, you know, there's an altar here and you place leave the desktop there. But I say, I think I need to place it outside. I know there's no space, but I need to place it outside. Well, what do you think? Do you think that I, I, I continue to fall into, into sin? Yes or no? Hey, I want you to know that it doesn't mean that when you put the desktop, okay, in the living room, you will not fall into sin. Why? It, it's really because my life, I was not seeking God. I was not reading the Word. I, the only time I tried to read the Word was before I sleep. And every time you try to do that before you sleep, what do you do? On the bed, you will really fall asleep. And that is really a quiet time with God. And because of that, I realized that, hey, I'm very susceptible. I'm, 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 I'm easily tempted. And I'm always, I can tell you, even my parents are sleeping. And my sisters are sleeping, I will still go to the desktop in the living room and I will still sin against the Lord. Why, do I, why, why am I sharing this with you? The only time I had a victory was I began to realize that I need to seek God. I need to keep seeking God. I cannot allow the lust that is within me, the evil desires within me to, to, to overcome me. But I need to keep, keep seeking the Lord. I need to keep reading the, the Word. I need to keep praying. And, 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 and kids, so I need to even call my, my cell leader and pray for me as well. And that is what I mean by seeking the Lord and fleeing. Like what Apostle Paul says, you flee away from temptation and you pursue God's righteousness. And that is how I overcame. And it's the same thing. If you talk about if you're attracted to someone, if you, you know that you're so-called attracted, or maybe to you, you found that you're in love with someone. Are you allowing all these emotions to guide you towards certain evil desires? Are you listening to your own voice? Are you listening to what uh, Korean drama is telling you? Are you listening to what your friends in your class are telling you? Or are you saying, God, can you please tell me I'm, I'm seeking you right now? Can you please tell me what I should do? What does your word, what, did, what, are you, what do you want me to do? And I want to tell you, if you are seeking God in regards to this area of your life, I can tell you, you will always be on, on God's path. You will always live a life that is holy and righteous. Uh, let's just say that you have conflict at home or even in a cell group. What do you do? What? So angry, you know. This cell leader is so unreasonable. This cell brother, what? Every time sit down outside sun tank, so, so smelly. That's why I say don't have cell group at Suntec. Huh? And, wow, so, wow, I, can, wow, I cannot take it. Wow. I feel like leaving this cell group. I feel like leaving church. But have you ever said God? I said, God, this is what's happening in my cell group, you know. I, I cannot stand all these people, especially the one with the socks. I've been telling him for many months, but the socks is still the same. But I can tell you, if you seek God, and you truly ask God, what does God say about this situation of your life? I can tell you, God will tell you that, hey, continue to love Him. Continue. Maybe you should even buy a new pair of socks for Him. And that is how you keep yourself being holy, being pure, even in your heart, in regards to the situations and areas of your life. Let me, let me go to verse 19. Let me, let me say this. Okay, let me read this. Verse 19 says, Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm. It's sealed with this inscription. The Lord knows those who are His, and 
everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. You see, Apostle Paul, he was writing to Timothy because he knows that Timothy was discouraged. He was disappointed because there are church members who bounce at him, who, who was lured away, his church members, so-called church members, lured away by false teachers, and also because I think he was in prison once for his faith. It is, he's in a very negative circumstances. But Apostle Paul, he seeks to assure Timothy, and that's why the first part of verse 19, he says, Nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands. And what Apostle Paul was telling Timothy, Hello, I know that you are disappointed. I know that you're discouraged. But don't ever ever listen to the disappointment or the discouragement in your heart. Because you will be lured away. The devil will tempt you away. But I want you to know God's solid foundation still stands. Which means that God's salvation is still valid. God's purposes and plan for your life is still valid. Do not ever, ever focus on this disappointment and, and discouragement in your life. Focus on what God has in store for you. And that's why it goes on to say that, that, that still with this inscription, there was two statements. Okay, in the past, the practice back then was engraved. On, on a foundation stone, on what, what was the purpose of the building and, and why, why uh, this, this building is there. And so these two statements, to these two seals that Apostle Paul told him, tells Timothy how he can stand upon this foundation. That's what the first statement he says. The Lord knows those who are His. The Lord knows those who are His. What this means is that, Hello, Timothy. Hello, Clayton. Hello, Matthew. Hello, Rachel. Hello, Carissa. Hello. I want you to know that God knows who you are. God knows where you are and what you need. He understands what you are facing. He's watching over you. He is your shepherd. And you are His sheep. But you need to seek Him. And you will know His voice. And you truly seek God, you truly belong to Him. And that's why the second part, it says, everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. This means that other than just seeking God, you must turn away, flee from temptation, turn away from your evil desires. So to sum it up, what Apostle Paul was telling Timothy is this, Hello, seek God. Turn away from sin. Whatever it is, seek God beyond your disappointment. Seek God beyond your, beyond your discouragement. Seek God beyond your anger. Turn to God. Don't ever, ever let all these negative, so you, the negative feelings that you have, the negative circumstances that you have, the sinful feelings that you have, bring you away from God and lure you to, to, to your evil desires that you fall into sin, don't ever, ever let the devil have a foothold on you because your faith rests in God and not in man. Seek God. How many of you can say an amen to that? Can we just climb onto the Lord? Come on. The Lord desires you to seek Him today. You know, there's an important scripture that I lay hold on my life, in my life all these years. And it's in Psalms 119, verse 9 to 16. It says, How can a young man stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Praise be to you, Lord. Teach me your decrees. With my lips, I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes. As one rejoices in great riches, I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. And this is such an important verse in my life. Because one of the things that I truly desire as, as a new Christian back then, and even right now, was to have a pure heart before the Lord. It was to, to live a life that is pure and, and, and holy before the Lord. And, and I only know the only way that we can do it is found in this verse. That when, when you seek God with all your heart, when you allow the Word 
of God to be within you, to be in your heart. There is no way that you can sin against God. There is no way this temptation can lead you to sin. And I want you to know that God is really the only defense that we have. You can, well, I think it's practical to put away things. Well, I also have church members who come to me and say, Pastor, can you lock my safari on my smartphone? Well, I did that. He still went to sin against the Lord. You see, it's not about the practical thing that, that you do to, to stop yourself from sinning against the Lord. But it is, our, it is when our spirit, when we have the attitude of seeking God, that is where, that is our, our only defence. That's why the other verse that I hold on to is Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. You see, the reason why a lot of us, we don't find God in our life is really because we don't seek Him. But the Word of God tells us that we will find Him when we seek Him with all our heart. With all our heart. That's why in my life, you know, when I sin against the Lord, or when, or whenever I have a, I feel that I feel my, feel as a husband or as a father, I did things I shouldn't do, or even when I, I find that I'm very burnt out, so-called, well, burnt out in the ministry, or I feel that I'm very tired at work. One of the things that I always come back to is to sing this song called a Pure Heart. I'm not too sure whether you all know of this song, but I thought that it's a song that is. It's, well, how should I say it? It's my two teach you, okay? It's a team song of my life. So if ever there's a drama on Guang Han, right? And, uh, well, and the need to, need to check is my wife, uh, Melissa. Well, I think this pure heart is, should be the two teach you, okay? It should be the team song. I'm going to sing it to you, and I want you to listen to the, the cry of this song. Listen to my cry as well. When I sing this song, it really touches me of how I sing the Lord. Okay? A pure heart, that's what I long for. Well, you can sing with me as well. That follows her after thee. A pure heart. That's what I long for A heart that follows on after thee A heart that hides your word So that sin will not come in A heart that's undivided the one who rules and reigns A heart that beats compassion That pleases you, my Lord A sweet aroma of worship That rises to your throne Can you sing the chorus with me? A heart that hides your word a heart that hides your word So that sin will not come in A heart that's undivided A one who rules and reigns A heart compassion That pleases you, my Lord A sweeter road It's just so important that that we seek God with all our hearts, that we seek God desiring a pure heart. Because God wants you to live a life that is holy and righteous. And I, I want to encourage you. You know, if there's a song that 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 does help you to draw close to God, if there's a song that that you know when you're down or when you know that you're far away from God, go and listen to that song. 
and make it your, the theme song of your life. And, and this is one of my theme songs, the theme song that I will use whenever I go for a prayer retreat or whenever I'm, I'm at home or whenever that I feel I'm far away from the Lord. How many of you desires to walk a life that's holy and righteous? Can you just wave at me right now? Why don't you turn to the person on your left and right and say, Seek God. And that's why the first way that we can flee from temptation is to seek the Lord. You see, when we seek the Lord, we enter into His presence. And the second way that we can flee from temptation is to serve the Lord. And when you serve the Lord, you enter into His purposes and He gives you a focus in your life. Why don't you turn to the person on your left and say, Serve the Lord. And that's why in verse 20 and 21, the Apostle Paul reminds Timothy about serving God. He does so with an analogy. In a large house, there are articles, not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for special purposes and some for common use. Those who cleanse themselves from the leather will be instruments for special purposes, made wholly useful to the master and prepared to do any good work. See, basically what, and what this verse, these two verses says, that those who are cleansed can then be set on God's special purposes and be useful to Him in doing the good works that God has prepared for us to do. See, do note that there's a key word in verse 21. Those who cleanse themselves. Well, I think it's not saying that by serving God or doing things for God, we are made righteous or we are made we are cleansed, but rather the work of cleansing is really God's work in our lives as we actively seek Him. And you see, when we actively seek God, we'll begin to realize the, the, the areas in our, our lives that require repentance, and then we confess. That's why in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, it says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. You see, we are cleansed to do these good works for God. See, notice in verse 21, in the, the last three words, it says what? Any good work. In our, our other translation, it says every good work. You see, serving God is not just being used by Him in the primary sense of, of serving the church, but this every good work, or this any good work, refers to God wanting to use you and I for every areas of our lives. It includes our schools, our workplace, uh, our homes, our families, our community, and even in the church. And this is God's call for us. Wherever we are, we are to be the clean vessel, the honourable vessel that He will use. And we are always to be reminded to set ourselves apart for God as a vessel that He can use. You see, in Romans chapter 6, verse 13, it says, Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to Him as an instrument of righteousness. You see, if you know that you are being saved, God wants to use you. God wants you to serve Him. That is why everything that we say, that we think, that we do, must be for the Lord, wherever you are. We must not give any part of our lives over to evil desires or over to sin, but instead, we are to serve Him with our whole being. We must offer every part of ourselves to serve Him. Why? Because we are His instruments of righteousness. And when we recognize that we are to serve Him, when we recognize that God, we are God's vessel everywhere that we are, we will be filled with the purposes of God in our lives. I can tell you with that, no temptation can overcome you. And that is really how you flee from temptation. You see, why does serving God actively help us flee from temptation? You know why? Let me point to you to a quote from Charles Spurgeon. He says, the most likely man to go to hell is the man who has nothing to do on earth. Idle people tempt the devil to tempt them. Oh, very scary. The most likely man to go to hell is the man who has nothing to do on earth. 
Idle people tempt the devil to tempt them. You see, quite often, it is our idleness as believers that leads us to temptation. You see, to put it bluntly, if you, when you can actively and wholeheartedly serve the Lord, I want you to know if you do that, literally, you don't have the bandwidth to fall into temptation. Literally, even if the devil wants to come and tempt, tempt you, you, your life is so filled with purpose. You say, hello, don't waste my time. I'm so filled with the purpose of, of God. I want to see God's purposes coming past in my life. But if you look at what idleness is, if you look at the imagery of what Charles Spurgeon said, it's actually very serious, you know. You see, the devil tempts every one of us. Everyone. The devil tempts every one of us. But if you are idle, we are tempting the devil to tempt us. Oh, wow, that's very scary. It means that other people, okay, Maybe one demon go and tempt them. But if you're either, 1,000 demons come to you. It's a whole legion. And that is how you open the door to sin. And that is how you open the door to the devil to cause you to be disrupted. They remove the purposes of God in your life. And that is how you fall away from Him. And that is how you will never ever come back to the Lord. But I want you all to listen to me very carefully. I'm not saying that we must be busy people, you know. Wow, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Every single day of our lives to keep ourselves busy so that we will not fall into temptation, so that we will not think about the things of the world, we will not fall into sin. This is not what I meant, you know. What I meant is simply that if we truly serve the Lord, if you truly know that you are an instrument of righteousness wherever you are, you will know that you are not an instrument for the devil. And you know that you have to serve God with all your heart. And then, that's where you become more and more aligned with God's heart. And that in itself helps us to flee from temptation. Well, I'm sure we all remember the story of David and Bathsheba. Alright? David and Bathsheba, not David and Goliath. I know some of us are thinking about that. David and Bathsheba, I remember. I think quite a few, few sermons back, I told you about this, this name is the worst name. Bathe Sheba. She's inviting you to bathe her. Bathe Sheba. Bathe Sheba is a very singlish term. Bathe Sheba. Nishi Bathe Sheba. Okay? You see, when King David, he fell into sin. What was the sin? What was the sin? Yes. Wow, well, you know. Praise God, man. You have a pure heart. <laughs> He committed adultery with Bathsheba, Bathsheba. But what led to that sin? Let's take a look. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1, it says, In the spring, in the spring, okay, not winter, not, not to Tobo, uh, in the spring, at the time where kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. Hello? Very weird, right? First statement says, when kings go to, off to war, he never says when the generals, when the, what, the soldiers go off to war. But he says when the king goes off to war. But David remained in Jerusalem. What happened? You see, the moment you are not you're not fulfilling God's purpose for your life. You know that, you, that it's a, supposed to be a time for King David to go out to war, but he didn't go to. And that's what led to his idleness. And what happened? He saw Bathsheba bathing and that was the beginning of temptation and that temptation led to sin. And that destroyed his life for the first nine months until he came to repentance before the Lord. What started all that was because of idleness. He was idle. He was supposed to serve God. He was supposed to be fulfilling God's purpose in springtime. I think maybe he a bit blur, he thought it's winter. But it is springtime. And he was idle. He was supposed to serve God. James chapter 4, verse 7 tells us Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. You see, when he says submit, okay, in this verse, it refers to obey or to make yourself a subordinate to God. Literally to do the work the Lord has called you to do. 
You see, when we don't do the work that the Lord has called us to do, we will, we will become idle. And, and what happens is we open up ourselves up to temptation and we will lead us to sin. And I want to say this once again. I'm not saying that we must keep ourselves busy so that we will, will not sin against the Lord. In fact, what I want to say is that, that it is so important to keep ourselves serving the Lord in a very purposeful way, in a purposeful manner. Don't ever, ever serve God until you're so busy, until you're totally burned out, until you don't need to sleep. I'm not saying that. But I'm just saying that we need to serve God purposefully, knowing that we have a sense of purpose. And some of us here, when we serve God, whether you're serving in the hospitality team, whether you're serving in the Levites, or any other ministry or platform that the Lord has given to you, some of us, we are serving the Lord. But in our hearts, we have lost that purpose. And that is how, when you, have, when you lost that purpose, I can tell you, you find that it's, you, don't, you don't find that joy, you know, coming to serve the Lord. And I want to encourage you, if that's who you are right now, I want you to seek God and come back to that purpose that God has for you, whether as a Levite, whether, whether as an usher, or whether is it in the social media team, or whether is it in the, in, in the, in the tech team. Serving the Lord, I want to say again, it's not about filling your time, but rather focusing your life, focusing on the Lord. Colossians chapter 3, verse 2, it says, Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. You see, when you serve God, when you seek God, you set your mind on things above. And that is how you can flee from temptation. And that is how, that is how you can live a life that is holy and pure. And that's why in verse 5 in Colossians chapter 3, it says, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. And I want to encourage you today, when you set your mind to serve God, you will flee from temptation. When you set your mind to serve God, when you, when you tell God, God, I'm your instrument of righteousness. Lord, use me. And that is where you'll be able to put to death all the evil desires and you can walk in holiness. So how can we flee from temptation? The first way to flee from temptation is to seek the Lord. And that's where we, when we seek the Lord, we continually enter into His presence. And when we, we seek the Lord above all the things that we are experiencing in our lives so that we can focus on Him, so that we can walk right with Him. And the second thing that helps us to flee from temptation is to serve the Lord. And that's, why when we, that's how we enter into His purposes. And that's why it helps us to stay focused, to serve the Lord and, and, and keep us far away from all the evil desires and temptation. And, I want to, and as I end of this sermon, I just want to share a testimony with all of you from uh, Camp Alive. How many of you went for our youth camp recently? Make some noise, come on. I think it was a very powerful camp where God came and encountered us. Yeah, I know that probably you missed the camp. That's why you, ooh. But we cannot go to the camp because if the camp becomes two weeks, a two weeks camp, we will be very idle. So it's good that we keep it to four days, three nights. But this, this, this testimony came from one of you. You know, during the evaluation, you all will get to write your story and how God has changed you. And when I look at the 300 over entries, there were, we were just so encouraged by what God is doing. But there's one particular testimony that I want, to, I want to share with all of you. And I do not know who you are, but I just want to thank you for allowing me to share this testimony. But I think it's okay for for me to share with everyone. Okay, uh, the, uh, the testimony goes like this. During the first session where Pastor Guang Han preached, I felt that he really spoke to me. Before the camp, I honestly was struggling and I felt like I was drifting away from the Lord. I was trying so hard to manage my time and studies, trying to get good grades for my examination and tests that I neglected, doing daily devotion for a long time. Even though I knew that I was drifting away and did talk to my leader about it, I didn't have the self-discipline to carry out what my leader advised me, and, st and I still did not do my daily devotion. In fact, I did exactly what Pastor Kwang Han mentioned about those who drifted away. 
I felt reluctant to go to church as I kept worrying about school and how I should rush home quickly to, do, to finish my work. And when, and when Pastor Kwan preached about the spiritual battle and how real it was, it really, really woke me up and made me realize that it is a scary thing and I should go back to the Lord. In addition to that, I'm actually the prayer point coordinator of my secondary school. And to be real, I was started to lose hope as I, I, I started to lose hope because I don't see that this prayer point is growing. And I felt like I don't feel like going to prayer point in times. And I was disappointed when people last minute cancel and make excuses for not coming, which really made me feel inadequate and just losing faith in prayer point. I felt that maybe I was not good enough to be a prayer point coordinator. And I felt disappointed as to why I'm I trying so hard to make time and set date to pray when people just last minute cancer. However, during Pastor Charmin's preaching about prayers, I realized that maybe it's just because of me drifting away and not committing to praying daily caused myself not to experience God's power and the fact that I was losing faith in God. And during Jasper's session, I really felt that it spoke to me as well when he asked us to pray for a stranger. I was, was really amazed at how God used a stranger to speak to me as everything she said was really how I felt and the struggles I faced was also mentioned. It really opened my eyes to see how God is so real and here's my, my everyday prayer. Every prayer, even when I couldn't see Him, I couldn't hear Him. He hurt me and loves me and this touched my heart. And lastly, during Pastor Melissa's message about the Holy Spirit, I felt that I learned a lot. And to be honest, since I'm now in secondary, I had to change my classes. And the class I went was different from the rest of my close friends. And surprisingly, they all landed in the same class as well uh, as, as me. I was in a different class and with people that I was not so familiar with. I struggled to make friends, especially when they all had their own groups. And I felt left out from my own group of friends. I felt judged insecure and lonely at times. I place my identity in the opinions of others and what they think of me, that I just drifted a lot from the Lord. I, I felt disappointed with myself as I felt that I needed to be closer to the Lord and be someone very holy as a prayer point coordinator. I thought that God could be very disappointed with me as well. And nevertheless, I was yet reminded by people who prayed for me that God still loves me very much and I don't have to fit in with the rest of the world because my identity is found in Jesus that I should place my security in Him. When I was praying, I was reminded that when I was younger during G Kids, even though I was born a Christian, I never felt God's presence in my life. And so I questioned God, God, if you're real, then tell me you love me. And I actually expected to get no reply as I never heard God's voice before. Then, but at that time during worship, a cell leader from another cell came up to me and prayed for me and told me, I feel that God wants me to tell you that He loves you very much. And I just cried uncontrollably. And when I was reminded of it, as, as, as it really showed me how real God is in my life and I should live this life for God and serve Him and not for the people. I remembered how my friend used to tell that since we are all jars of clay that are so fragile, don't try to squeeze yourself into another mold that you can't fit in because that is not where you belong. Can we just thank God for this testimony? Thank you for allowing me to share your testimony, whoever you are. Before the camp, she was drifting away from God. And, th then, and that is why I always tell you, it's important to go for youth camp, it's important to go for retreat because these are extended time that we can have to seek God and not be so distracted with things of the world. But you see, we look at the cry of her heart. And she knew that she was drifting away. But yet he told God, God, I want to seek you. And God came to pass. God became so real for, for, for him or her in the, in the camp. And God spoke through people to her. And, just, and it's just so powerful. And, and that she was someone who was serving God even in school. Who was, she was leading people into prayer. But yet he was just so discouraged. And but when he learned to seek God with all her heart, and that is where she encountered God. And I just want to point out something to all of you. I was just reading even her testimony. And the Lord just spoke to me very clearly that I need to, to address this thing. Okay? One of the statements that she shared was, I felt that I'm not as, I'm not holy 
to be a prayer coordinator. I'm not holy. See, many of us, we are brought into the lie, the deception, that we must be perfect, you know, in order for God to use us, in order for us to serve God. We must be holy, we must get our act right. A cell leader, let me, let me get my life right first. Let me get my, the issues in my life right first before I can serve. No? Uh, today I want to say this to you. You don't have to be a perfect person in order to be used by God. But you do have to have a pure heart. You don't have to be a perfect person to be used by God, but you do have to have a pure heart. To, to simply put it, if you want to be used by God, all you need to do is to purify your heart. If all you desire is to seek God with a pure heart and to serve Him with a pure heart, I want you to know that God will use you, irregardless whether you think that you're capable or not, whether you think that, that, that you have the gift of the gap. But God uses all kinds of people. Let me go back to verse 21 in 2 Timothy chapter 2. If you keep yourself pure, you will be a special utensil for honourable use. Your life will be clean and you'll be ready for the Master to use you for every good work. God uses all kinds of people. He uses people of all shapes and sizes, whether you're introvert or whether you're extrovert, whether, regardless of your background, your age, whether you're a man or whether you're a woman, whether you feel that you're ordinary or not, God will use you if you have a pure heart. But there is one thing that God will not use. It's written in the verse. God will not use a dirty vessel, a vessel that is not pure, that is not pure before Him. And that is why, I want today I want to tell you young people, if you want to be used by God, if you want to serve God, there's only one criteria, that you have a pure heart before the Lord. You see, as we, as we continue to walk with God, there's all kinds of temptation that may come. I want you to know. Some of us, we may fall. Some of us, you know, we drift away. Even in our hearts, we, we can be here. But I want you to know that do not ever, ever give up seeking God. Do not ever, ever give up serving God. Always ask God for a pure heart. And I want to speak to our friends who's who's here with us for the very first time and if you've never ever given your life to Jesus, now I want you to know that the fact that you are here is a divine moment that God, God wants to have with you. God loves you. He knows who you are. He knows the struggles that you have. He knows that there are things in your life that you know that you shouldn't be doing but you are still doing it. And God wants you to know that if you want to have victory over those areas of your life, if you, know, if you know that you want to overcome certain areas of your life that you know that is, is not right, the only way for you to get out of that is to give your life to Jesus today. And today, when you give your life to Jesus today, in, in John chapter 3, verse 16, tells us, for, for God so loved the world that He gave His one and only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. And today, if you give your life to Him today, I want you to know that He forgives you. Your sins are cleansed. And today, when you say that I believe in you, in you, Jesus, you're saying, Jesus, I believe that you died for me on the cross. That on the cross, all my sins are forgiven. And I want to be your child. And God knows your heart today. He knows what you're struggling with. God wants, God wants to cleanse you. Can we just all close our eyes and just bow our heads right now? And... and and some of you, you're probably you're asking me, Pastor Guang Han, how do I believe in this Jesus? And this is what I'm going to do as I ask you to close your eyes and to bow your head. All you need to do is to, to pray after me. And this prayer is designed for you to receive Jesus into your heart. And all you need to do is to repeat after me word for word and line by line and, and mean it with all your heart. And, I, and, and when you do that, I want you to know that that your name is written in the book of life, that you will become a child of God. 
and and that you will just begin as begin to know that there's this God who has created you and loves you and desires for you to seek Him, to have a personal relationship with Him. And I can want you to know that you will have victory over the areas of your life that you feel that you are defeated. So why don't you pray with me right now? Dear Heavenly Father, Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your love. I thank you for your love. I thank you that that I I thank you that I am here today. Thank you that I'm here today. Today I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. Today I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. Today I believe in Jesus. Today I believe in Jesus. That He died for me on the cross. That He died for me on the cross. And today I confess. And today I confess that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. That Jesus is my Lord and Savior. And today I give my life to Him. And today I give my life to Him. Dear Jesus. Dear Jesus. Come and cleanse me. Come and cleanse me. Come and help me. Come and help me to walk in victory. To walk in victory. I don't want to be a failure. I don't want to be a failure. I want to be a victor in my life. I want to be a victor in my life. Help me to know you. Help me to know you. And if that's and you have said that prayer with me, and if that's who you are, the count of three, I want you to lift up your hands as high as you can and just put it and and just don't put down. And even if and and the reason why I ask you to put up your hands is really because. I, I want to know who you are. I want to pray a special blessing for you, and to and and to I pray that you will really come to know this God who truly loves you for who you are. And and if you have never said that prayer with me, or you probably have said it in your heart, or, or said it in your mind, or just somehow that you know that you need to receive Jesus into your life. At the count of three, I want you to lift up your hands. I'm gonna count to three right now. If that's who you are, I want to know where you are, and just lift up your hands. I'm gonna count right now. One. Two, three. Lift up my hands, right now. Don't put down. Lift up my hands. I see your hands over there. Don't, don't put down. All right. I'm gonna pray for you right now, Father. I just want to give thanks, my brothers and sisters who have lifted up their hands to you, Lord. Today they are your children. Today they will experience victory in their lives. That today that they will begin to understand what it means to have a personal relationship with you, which is such a beautiful thing. And I pray that Lord, that you will just watch over them and protect them as well. So Lord, I want to give thanks for this time and give thanks for their lives because today is the day of salvation. In Jesus' name, we pray. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Can we just all stand up and right now and just thank the Lord? Come on, let's just praise the Lord for what He has done. Woo! Come on, let's just clap louder and thank Him. Woo! Good Lord. You know, friends, if you have lifted up your hands or you know that you need to receive Jesus into your life, you know, right after service, I, I, I just want to invite you, you know, your friends will bring you to the visitor's lounge where there will be a pastor who will connect with you and help you to know more about Jesus in your life. All right? And a new service. Today's, today's response, you know, to the Lord is very simple. I think that I just have a few things that the Lord has placed upon my heart. I think the first, the first group of, of people, you need to respond to God if you know that you have stopped seeking God in your life. Whether is it reading the Bible, whether is it coming to Him in daily devotion, or, or, or just even seeking God for the decisions that you need to make in your life, the different areas. If you know that you have stopped seeking God, why don't you come and respond to the Lord? And maybe there are some of you, your idol means that that you know in your heart, God wants you to serve in, in, in a particular area. Where, whether is it in hospitality, or whether is it some other area, or whether is it being a prayer coordinator, or going even to the prayer point, or, or reaching out to your friends. If you, if you know that in your, in your life, that there is a sense of idleness. The Lord wants you to respond to Him. And you need, and you need to start putting into action, serving Him. And, and the third group of people, as I mentioned, some of you have been serving God. But after a while, you lose that heart of, of serving Him. You find it's purposeless. You find it, there's no joy. You find it so tired to wake up so early in the morning. But, but I just want you to know that serving God and seeking God comes hand in hand. You see, when you serve God, you, you will keep wanting to seek Him. And you want to have breakthroughs in the area of service to Him. But perhaps maybe you have lost that. You have lost that sense of purpose. And that's why you need to come and, and seek Him again. 
And the fourth, fourth group of people, you, you know that you are, you are struggling with the sin in your life. The Lord wants to cleanse you. The Lord wants to give you the victory. And the Lord wants to give you a pure heart. And the last group of people, as I mentioned just now, God uses everyone. God doesn't use people who's perfect. He uses imperfect people. But the vessel that God uses is someone with a pure heart. As long as you have a pure heart of seeking Him. As long as you have a pure heart of willingness to want to serve Him, I want you to know that God will use you. Can we just lift up our hands right now? I just sense that I just need to pray for you and set you apart as instruments of righteousness. Father, I want to declare for all, all of us here this afternoon, I want to declare in the name of Jesus, Lord, set us apart that we will be instruments of righteousness, that we will always remember that wherever we are, we are your vessels that you want to, want to use. That everywhere we go, whether it's in our family, whether it's in our school, whether it's in the community, or whether even in church as well, Lord, help us to know that we are your instrument, that you desire for us to serve you. But Lord, most importantly, I want to declare in the name of Jesus over all of us that we will always have a pure heart. That we will always have this desire to seek you, whether it's in the Word or whether it's in the different areas of our lives. Lord, we will seek you with all our hearts because Lord, your Word tells us that we will be able to find you. Lord, give us a pure heart, O oh God. Give us a pure heart so that we can live a life that is holy and pleasing unto you. Give us a pure heart so that, Lord, we will not fall into temptation and into sin. And I want to declare, Lord, in the name of Jesus, this is a generation that is holy unto you. I declare right now in Jesus' name that a fire of holiness will come upon them right now in Jesus' name. That there's a fire that is within them right now, that is stirring within their hearts, that they will have this strong desire for purity and holiness in their lives. So that, Lord, there will be a generation that can be used by you greatly. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. Can we just thank the Lord? As God's instrument of righteousness, I think it's important that we praise Him right now. Come on, let's just praise the Lord and end off this time praising Him. Come on. Woo!